It's my great uh, pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor David Chalmers from New York University. And of course, many, you know, almost everybody here knows uh, Dave's key contribution to this conference back in, in 94 with the hard, hard problem. And perhaps I would just like to draw attention to, to the role of philosophy plays in consciousness studies and also in these conferences. At that early stage it was quite crucial because uh, philosopher Dave helped to really uh, conceptualize the, the field and make some distinctions. So I think a lot of people felt they understood things. He went on to write a brilliant book, The Conscious Mind, where he kind of, which has the same clarity, but he also proposed a new new theory in terms of information, which is then in some ways we, we see resonances that in Tononi's work and also in some work in quantum mechanics. So, so, uh, so this is the, uh, and perhaps right now, of course we say philosophy is the mother of all sciences. So now that we have the science of consciousness, so maybe not so much philosophy, maybe we could still have more contributions. And I'm very happy that we will have today a major uh, keynote talk here. Please, let's welcome Dave. Great. Thanks, Pavo. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming. It's really a great pleasure to be back here at the uh, Tucson Consciousness Conference, where I think is pretty well the, uh, the 13th time. Lucky 13. Um, and thanks a lot to Stu and Abby and all the local organizers for doing a fantastic job in putting this conference on. I'm going to be talking today about what I call the meta problem of consciousness. I've, kind of, I've always liked the idea of meta. I did my uh, PhD with uh, Doug Hofstadter, author of Gödel Escher Bach, who's one of the pioneers of, uh, of going meta. I just found this quote on the, on the web attributed to my favorite philosopher, Rudolf Carnap, anything you can do, I can do meta. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Carnap did not say that. I don't, uh, I don't know who did, but it kind of is the spirit of the, uh, of the talk today. So um, I'm going to be talking about a problem I call the meta problem of consciousness. In general, meta, this word meta, X often means something like X about X, so metacognition is cognition about cognition, and a meta theory is a theory about a theory. So a meta problem is a problem about a problem. And in particular, the meta problem of consciousness I take to be the problem of explaining why we think there is a problem of consciousness and why we say there is a problem of consciousness. So it's a problem about a problem. Now what is the problem? What is the first problem that it's a problem about? No surprise. It's the hard problem of consciousness, the problem of explaining why and how physical processes give rise to conscious experience. I tried to find a picture of the hard problem on the web. The best I could come up, come up with was, was this one, which I, uh, I quite like because it looks like someone's hair is catching fire. But I think it's meant to be the fire of the mind arising somehow from the uh, processes in the brain. And that's the, uh, the hard problem of consciousness. Now, the hard problem is concerned with phenomenal consciousness, what it's like to be a subject. And this is a phrase that goes back at least to uh, my colleague at NYU, Tom Nagel, who wrote a famous article back in 1974 really posing the problem of consciousness in these terms. He called his article, what is it like to be a bat? And thought is, although we don't know what it's like to be a bat running sonar, there's presumably something it's like. He wants to know what it's like for a bat to be a bat. And thought is, if there's something it's like to be a bat, the bat is conscious. If there's nothing it's like, say, to be this table, then the table is not conscious. So we say, a system is phenomenally conscious if there's something it's like to be that system, if it has you know, a first-person point of view. And a mental state is phenomenally conscious if there's something it's like to be in that state. So my visual experiences 
right now. And there's something that's live for me to be seeing. So they're conscious. Maybe some, some computations going on deep in my cerebellum involving you know, routing things through the brain. Nothing it's like for me to be in those states. So they're not conscious. So you know, I mean, consciousness is very rich. We can think of all these components of the inner movie or the inner virtual reality, visual experiences, experiences of color and depth, other sensory experiences, sound and taste, experiences of your body, like pain or orgasm, mental imagery, recalled visual images of you know, your parents or your hometown, emotional experiences, happiness and anger, the stream of a current thought, reflection, decision, sometimes taking place in that inner voice we heard about the other day, maybe sometimes not. All of these are elements of the stream of consciousness. For all of them, there's something it's like to be in this state. And they all pose the hard problem of consciousness. I mean, these contrast with the easy problems of explaining behavioral and cognitive functions, like trying to explain perceptual discrimination of stimuli in the brain, integration of information, the way that you know, vision and sound might get brought together in the brain, the way we control behavior, the way we make reports. Those are all behaviors, ultimately, or functions in the, uh, in the interest of behavior. And we pretty well know the paradigm for explaining them. We don't have the explanations yet. In that sense, they're not easy. But we know how, in principle, to explain them. We explain the easy problems by finding a neural or a computational mechanism that performs that relevant function. Find the mechanism, like a neural circuit, which is responsible for the verbal report. You've explained the verbal report. Whereas for the hard problem, explaining behavioral functions seems to leave open a further question. Why does all that processing, all that discriminating and integrating and controlling and reporting, why does all that give rise to conscious experience? Why doesn't all that processing go on in the dark without consciousness? Now, why aren't we robots or zombies who do all this stuff without being conscious at all? Looks to many people as if there's an explanatory gap here between physical processes and subjective experiences, roughly because the problem of consciousness is not about these objective functions, but about subjective experience. So uh, here's another attempt at the best I could do to find, okay, here's the brain and here's this really cool stuff going on in your inner movie in consciousness. How do you get from one to the other? So, you know, over the years, there have been a lot of different approaches to the hard problem. I should say, I don't have a single solution to the hard problem that I think is the right solution. The last few years, I've been really interested in just focusing on different constructive avenues for solving the hard problem. So I've been looking at a lot of different ideas, including all the ones listed here on this slide. And in this talk, I'll end up going in a somewhat different direction. But OK, one class of approaches, the, the class I'm most sympathetic to in general, is to hold that consciousness is somehow fundamental and irreducible to physical, to standard physical processes. And this tends to lead one either to dualism, consciousness separate from the brain, panpsychism, Consciousness present at the very bottom level of the natural order, maybe some element of consciousness in every particle, or idealism, where the whole universe is constituted by consciousness. Now, we're going to hear more about at least the latter two this afternoon. Um, I've actually been, all of these have their problems. Dualism has the problem of interaction. Panpsychism has the combination problem. How do those little bits of consciousness add up? to our consciousness. Idealism has the problem of accommodating the external world, which seems to explain all the regularities in consciousness. I think there are interesting things to say about all those. I've been working on some of them, but today I'm going to look in a different direction. Um, another class of approaches to the hard problem, with which I'm somewhat less sympathetic overall, is to hold that consciousness is reducible, typically to some kind of physical or computational process. So functionalism thinks consciousness might ultimately be, say, some computational process, biological materialism, maybe consciousness is some neurobiological process, quantum materialism of the kind which I think um, Stuart and Rogers' view quite often sounds like, says consciousness is identical to some quantum process, like quantum collapses in 
microtubules. All of these somehow reduce consciousness to a physical process. I think all of these views are plagued by the problem of the explanatory gap. So I don't go in that direction myself. But that said, this talk is going to be exploring a, a proposal which is at least somewhat more in the spirit of reductionism than other views I've been, uh, I've been looking at in the past. And it kind of starts from a certain potential insight about a connection between the easy problems of consciousness and the hard problems. There's one behavioral function, at least, that's very closely related to the hard problem. And that's the fact that we make verbal reports about our conscious experience. People often call these phenomenal reports. We're here, phenomenal is always basically a shorthand word for conscious subjective experience. So I say, here's a behavioral fact about me. I say, I'm conscious, or maybe I say, I'm feeling pain right now. I mean, I say things like, hey, well, consciousness is very puzzling. There's a hard problem of consciousness. Distressingly often, since I'm a philosopher who's paid to, uh, to write about these things. But these are all verbal reports that I make that people at these conferences are making all the time. Those are behavioral facts. In principle, explaining those falls under the rubric of the easy problems. Even more specifically, to home in a bit further, is what we might call problem reports, reports expressing our sense that consciousness poses a hard problem. There's a hard problem of consciousness, I might say. Explaining behavior doesn't explain consciousness. I said something like that just a few minutes ago. Consciousness seems non-physical, kind of spooky, mysterious. I don't know how we could explain it. And people, you know, take a, maybe this audience is selected for thinking and saying things like that quite often. So I hope these problem reports are not foreign to you. Again, these are facts of behavior. So the meta problem of consciousness is roughly the problem of explaining those problem reports, those bits of behavior. In principle, that's a puzzle about behavior. So it's an easy problem and ought to be open to standard functional explanation. There ought to be some kind of computational or structural or some kind of explanation of that behavior, if there is in general for behavior. So the meta problem is strictly speaking an easy problem, but it's one that's closely tied to the hard problem. And prima facie, it looks more tractable than the hard problem. So it gives us a kind of a workable research project. At the same time, I think solving it really ought to shed very significant light on the hard problem. Maybe it won't solve it or dissolve it, but it ought to at least shed light on it. I mean, this, isn't, this is an instance of what philosophers sometimes call genealogical analysis, which is shedding light on a domain by looking at its genealogy or its history, you know, analyzing how our judgments about that domain are formed. Maybe the most familiar example of this would be thinking about religion. One approach to religion is just to think about God directly and what kind of properties does God have. But another approach, maybe more sociological or psychological, is to think, why do we believe in God? What are the roots? of our beliefs in God. Maybe someone tells an evolutionary story about why belief in God enhanced selection or why we have a deep psychological need for comfort, for comfort, for protection from the darkness, for social grouping, and religion facilitates that. So that's a very familiar line of explanation in people who think about religion and often leads to debunking our beliefs about those domains. People say, we can explain our belief in God without God, so we don't need the hypothesis of God. People have done something similar with morality and other domains. So one thing, one way to connect the meta problem and the hard problem is to see the meta problem as a debunking project, somehow explaining away our belief in consciousness without posing consciousness and then saying, hey, well, just as maybe after we've explained our beliefs in God, we don't really need this to believe in this independent phenomenon of God, the actual reality. Maybe you can explain our beliefs in consciousness without consciousness. So that line, which is only one line here, leads one in the direction which people, philosophers have recently um, taken to calling illusionism. The view that consciousness, or at least the problem of consciousness, is an illusion. And the key idea, which is actually really nicely laid out in an article by Keith Frankish on illusionism as a theory of consciousness that came out in the Journal of Consciousness Studies last year is, okay, all we have to do is explain the illusion 
why it is that we have these beliefs in these special properties of consciousness, explain the illusion, and we dissolve the, the problem. The idea is solving the meta problem will, in effect, dissolve the hard problem. Um, you know, Keith Frankish actually calls the meta problem the illusion problem. I don't call it the illusion problem because I myself don't think it's an illusion. So I think we need a more general name, hence I call it the meta problem. But I do recommend this, um, this special issue of JCS all about this topic. It's a, it's a time-honored move in philosophy, certain kinds of illusionism about the mind, explaining away certain phenomenon. It goes back to Immanuel Kant and his paralogisms and the critique of pure reason. He thought somehow the self, or at least the indivisibility of the self, was a transcendental illusion that we could explain away. Uh, in the 20th century, the Australian philosophers UT Place and David Armstrong came up with a phenomenological fallacy for explaining away certain beliefs in objects in our consciousness. I'll talk about Armstrong's headless woman illusion um, shortly as an idea of, as a way of generating our views. Dan Dennett has plugged illusionist views quite a lot in recent years under the idea of a user illusion, and I mentioned Keith Frankish already. But I should say, I am not an illusionist. I've got a sneaking sympathy for the view. Um, I think it's an interesting view that's very much worth taking seriously, and one of the things I want to do in this talk is to give a sympathetic explanation, uh, investigation of illusionism. But ultimately, I'm not an illusionist. I think I'm a realist about consciousness, which means I think consciousness is real and not an illusion. I'm inclined to think that merely solving the meta problem, although a very important project explaining all the things we say and believe about consciousness, does not on its own dissolve the hard problem. Consciousness is real, and we're left with the problem of explaining it. But I do respect the view. I also think that whatever you think about illusionism and the first order problem, the meta problem should, in many respects, be more tractable than the hard problem. Solving the meta problem will shed much light on the hard problem, even if it doesn't solve it. So it sort of serves as a neutral research project for everyone. It's in that spirit that I want to be investigating it in this talk. OK, so here's the, uh, the outline. I've just gotten through um, an extended introduction. I want to talk a bit about what, just what the meta problem is, how the research program works. I'll talk about potential solutions to the problem. And then I'll talk about the impact on some existing theories of consciousness, because I think it does have you know, a serious and interesting impact. Um, towards the end, I'll talk a bit about how the meta problem could be extended into an argument for illusionism and considerations for and against, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so the meta problem research program. So one thing I like about this meta problem is that it opens up a tractable empirical research pro program for everyone. If you're a reductionist or a non-reductionist, you're still faced with the meta problem. If you're an illusionist or not an illusionist, you're still faced with the meta problem, and you ought to have something to say about it. I think you know one thing we can try to do is try to solve it in a relatively neutral way and then think about the philosophical and scientific consequences. OK, so this raises the question, what is the meta problem exactly? I mean, I sort of characterize it roughly as explaining the problem reports, the things we say about the problem of consciousness. You might think physically explaining it. Is that quite right? A slightly better restatement of it, I think, which I'll go over all the pieces of. It's actually the problem of topic neutrally explaining what I'll call the problem intuitions, or else explaining why this is impossible. Uh, maybe the most straightforward of these is the last part, or explain why this is impossible. This is actually just meant as a rubric to make the meta problem a problem for absolutely everyone. Some people might think there's no solution to the meta problem. For whatever reason, you can't give an explanation of what we say about consciousness that meets the relevant constraints, say in topic neutral or physical or whatever terms, then I say, great, then the meta problem for you is to explain why this is impossible, why, in fact, you can't explain these bits of behavior that way. Um, the other bits are topic neutrality and intuitions. Very roughly, topic neutral explanation of problem intuitions means an explanation that doesn't mention 
consciousness. So we'll explain, it looks like for any bits of behavior, we can explain them ultimately in terms of, say, interaction among neurons or computational processes or anyway, some kind of interaction among components. The paradigm might be a computational or algorithmic explanation of our judgments, but this view needn't be committed to computation or algorithms. If you've got, say, uh, Roger's view that there's going to be new non-computational non dynamics in physics, then we'll explain these behaviors in terms of that kind of dynamics. It'll still ultimately be mathematical. We'll give an explanation of it that doesn't directly mention consciousness. We can just think of this as all some kind of structural explanation, interaction between components and some structural terms, ultimately producing this behavior. You might think this sounds a bit like epiphenomenalism, the view that consciousness doesn't do anything in the brain. I mean, of course, one, nat one very natural thing to think is that consciousness explains the things we say about consciousness. And I don't want to be denying that. All I want to say is that you can give explanations of the things we say that don't mention consciousness in these purely structural terms. So you could be even an interactionist dualist who thinks consciousness is really special and non-physical. Maybe consciousness is like that yellow dot in the, uh, in the graph, and it collapses the wave function and affects all those physical dots in some special way. Nonetheless, there may well be a structural explanation of how it does its thing. It collapses the wave function according to certain dynamics. We can lay out the probabilities, we can lay out the math, and give some kind of structural explanation of all that hap how well that happens without mentioning consciousness. Now then, the dualist would want to say, as a matter of fact, that yellow node, where it's all happening, that's consciousness. So um, then we'll say, um, actually consciousness is doing the work in realizing the structure. Likewise, a panpsychist might say, okay, well, you've got all this, this structural explanation of physical dynamics and behavior, and we can lay out a mathematical explanation of that in structural terms, but ultimately all of those fundamental nodes are little bits of consciousness. A panpsychist can say that. That's not epiphenomenalism. Nonetheless, we can give these structural explanations, and then some people, some people may want to say consciousness actually is what plays the underlying structural role in this network. But still, I'm just interested in looking at the structural, dynamic, mathematical explanations here. Now, what do I mean by the intuitions? The problem intuitions are going to be roughly dispositions or tendencies to make problem judgments and problem reports. I could just call the problem, explain the reports, but I think there's something a bit deeper in all of us, which is a tendency or a disposition to make those reports, to, you know, to feel the, uh, the problem, and that's really what we want to explain. Um, there's a question about whether these intuitions need to be the result of inference or not. I think for our purposes, they don't need to be, but maybe I'll skip over that point. What are the, um, what are the core problem intuitions, the core things that people have a tendency to think and judge and report that generate the problem of consciousness? I mean, these fall into a few categories, at least for a philosopher thinking about this. There are broadly metaphysical intuitions, like to the effect that consciousness doesn't seem to be physical. It seems to be non-physical, an intuition directly about the nature of consciousness. There are explanatory intuitions. Consciousness is hard to explain. There are intuitions about knowledge of consciousness, about the most famous is probably that thought experiment, of, you know, Mary in the black and white room, who's only ever seen black and white and knows all the physical facts, doesn't know what it's like to see red, sees red for the first time, she learns something new about the world, about subjective experience. There are uh, what philosophers call modal intuitions about conceivability or possibility. Maybe that, for example, zombies are conceivable, physical duplicates of us that behave just like us, but with no consciousness. I mean, it seems when I talk to you, I think and I hope that you're conscious, but it's at least conceivable that, uh, that some of you or all of you are not conscious. It's not something I can rule out with absolute certainty. That's the conceivability of zombies. These, of course, are the philosophical zombies. Someone that seems like a normal human, doesn't have conscious experience, sense experience or qualia, have all the physical states, none of the mental states. Now, I don't actually think there are zombies among us, but the idea seems to make sense, and that's one of the symptoms of one of the intuitions that can generate the hard problem of consciousness, one among many. So there are some related intuitions, maybe aren't quite as close to the core. Intuitions about whether, for example, machines or robots can be conscious. Intuitions about how much consciousness matters morally, 
It seems to be like the source of very much meaning and value for us in our lives. Intuition is about the self. Our self seems to persist through time in a special way. Intuition is about the presentation of special qualities, but here I'll focus mostly on the, um, the first class, especially the first two, metaphysical and explanatory. So in principle, there's an interdisciplinary research program here studying these intuitions. Many fields are relevant. That's one thing I like about this meta problem program. This is a very interdisciplinary field. This is an interdisciplinary program that many areas can work on that still fe will feed directly into the core philosophical problem. So there's experimental philosophy and psychology where people can study intuitions about consciousness in human beings. There are comput there's computational modeling from the perspective of AI and computational psychology. There's neurobiological modeling of processes that lead to intuitions and report. And indeed, there's philosophical analysis. I mean, this is an empirical question. How widely these intuitions are shared. You know, does everybody have the intuition that there's a hard problem? Does everyone have the intuition that consciousness is non-physical? Certainly, many people deny these claims. I mean, typically, in my experience, the majority of people seem to have them. Um, and even the ones who deny them are often denying them for, you know, can see that they had the intuition initially and then have some theoretical reasoning that might overcome it. But still, it is an empirical question how widely these intuitions are shared. Are they just a matter of our culture, for example? Are they shared cross-culturally? Are they shared historically? My sense is they're widely shared, but we don't really have that much current data on this. I'd like to get a lot more data about just on these intuitions. There is quite a lot of current empirical work on intuitions about the mind, especially in children, but also in adults. Um, you know, Paul Bloom has a very nice book called Descartes' Baby, where he argues that, you know, children are little intuitive dualists, the little Cartesians who believe that they are non-physical or the mind is non-physical. Still, for the most part, it's not so much about the hard problem intuitions about consciousness. There's work on belief, the concept of belief. There's work on how the self persists through time and, you know, whether we could have an afterlife or reincarnate or whatever. There's work on distribution of consciousness in robots. Not that much to date on the core problem intuitions, but there is one very nice article that just came out last year by Sarah Gottlieb and Tanya Lombroso called Can Science Explain the Human Mind? where they studied people's judgments about when various mental phenomena are hard to explain. And they said, you know, when, they, when they're conscious, when they're experienced, when they involve privileged access somehow in introspection, people seem to have much stronger intuitions that these are hard things for science to explain. So that's the beginning of a research program. There's room for much more. Okay, so next I want to talk about some potential solutions. So there is, there is quite a lot of work out there on the meta problem. I mean, this is not exactly a new problem. The one strange and weird thing about it is that there's really not a unified literature on this. Everyone who writes on this topic writes as if they're talking about it for the first time. Um, here's, here's a great idea. We should you know, try and explain why we think these weird things about consciousness. So one thing I'm trying to do with this talk is to bring this together and to really kick off a unified um, research program on the topic. But here are a few promising ideas. I actually wrote a bit about this back in my first book in 96, The Conscious Mind, where I offered my own tentative solution to the meta problem. I'm not sure that it works, but I think there are some promising ideas which have emerged over the years. Here are a few of them, each of which I'll just say a little bit about, and there have been a few key figures here. So one very natural idea is that you know, our judgments about consciousness and our judgments about our own mind are mediated by introspective models, models that we have of our own mind, just as we have models of the external world attributing certain properties to it, we likewise have models of our own mental processes. And maybe those models are distorted or misleading in certain ways. Maybe the most interesting recent discussion of this is by Michael Graziano in his very nice book, Consciousness and the Social Brain, where he argues that a lot of our intuitions about consciousness come from distorted internal models of processes of attention. He doesn't say very much about how you get something like hard problem intuitions about this. He does say once or twice that he thinks these models might in principle explain our sense there's a problem 
of consciousness. I mean, I think this is, again, a very promising initial idea, but every, the devil is going to be in the details. Okay, what is it? How do our introspective models generate our sense that there's a problem of consciousness? I should say Graziano is an illusionist, but you don't need to be an illusionist to go this way, even if you're a non-illusionist, a realist about consciousness. Presumably, we nevertheless have certain kinds of introspective models of ourselves. How they work is something very interesting to know. Um, Tom Nagel, who I mentioned, Brian Law, and other philosophers have argued for a key role for our concepts in thinking about consciousness. We have special introspective concepts of our mental states that are independent of physical concepts in certain ways, psychologically. And somehow these concepts will explain our problem reports, because the way we think about the mind from the inside comes apart from the way we think about the external world. Again, I think that's a very promising idea, but you know, there are some limitations. One limitation is you know, the problem of consciousness is generated much more strongly, say, by experience than by, say, belief. I believe that Paris is in France. Okay, that's interesting. It doesn't seem to pose the hard problem in quite the same way. Maybe there's some tinge of a current experience there, but in general, my having beliefs about the world doesn't seem to generate the hard problem, but we still have concepts of belief and introspective models. Question, why don't they generate the same sense of an explanatory gap? I think that means that we need to add more to the story that just brings in models and concepts to explain why conscious experience really distinctively generates the explanatory gap. Um, there's an idea which is out there, maybe most strongly associated with David Armstrong, that says something like this. We don't see that consciousness is physical, so we see it as non-physical, because somehow it's introspectively opaque. You can't see the neurons, you can't see the physical mechanisms of consciousness when you, when you introspect. Armstrong makes an analogy with um, the so-called headless woman illusion, which is very common in, uh, in circuses, or used to be very common in circuses. So here's the uh, so-called headless woman illusion. Um, there's, a, there's a woman sitting there, and somehow it looks as if she doesn't have a head. In fact, what's going on is there's actually a curtain uh, covering her head. You don't, and Armstrong's thinking, well, you don't see her head, so you infer that she has no head somehow, and you have the illusion that there's no head. I think this is kind of an interesting idea, but I mean, when you think about it for a second, though, it's like, surely this is not enough. I can, okay, I can cover up a few people's heads. I don't suddenly see you as having no head. There's got to be very special conditions that obtain of the headless woman. Maybe the curtain has to be positioned just right in such a way that it positively suggests headlessness to you. And I think, likewise, with, uh, with consciousness. It's, like, it's not enough to say we don't see that consciousness is physical. Many things we don't see are physical. Maybe the computer processes I'm interacting with inside my computer. I've got no idea what's going on there, but I don't suddenly think, wow, explanatory gap. So we need some special reasons, again, that we, that we make the inference, say, to non-physicality and specialness in the case of consciousness. An idea that I've got a lot of sympathy with is primitive quality attribution. So there's this idea about color experience, especially, that it attributes primitive properties to objects when, in fact, they have really complex um, physical properties. And, you know, here's a picture of, here's a fanciful picture of color perception. The world looks to us as if the apple has that simple, beautiful, primitive redness, and the sun has that primitive yellowness, and, you know, colors are these simple, qualitative properties of the world. And then science comes along and tells us, no, it's way more complicated than that. There's just these complicated physical processes of radiation and reflection. Okay, but we still see the world as having these primitive qualities. Why? Presumably because it's useful. I kind of, I've read a paper once where I suggested, you know, maybe this is how it was in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, things uh, really had those primitive special qualities of redness and yellowness. And then we underwent a fall from Eden, so now we're in this non-Edenic physical world. But it's still useful to model our world as having these Edenic qualities in the case of color, special qualities. So Dirk Paraboom and his work on this has suggested maybe we do something like this with the mind. Um, the mind involves attributing special qualities to itself for this useful model. I sort of think this doesn't quite get to the heart of the matter, because what really generates the problem of consciousness isn't just the qualities in the world that we perceive, or even in the mind, but our awareness of those 
qualities. But I think this is getting closer to the heart of the matter. A connected idea that I like is what I call primitive relation attribution. Introspective experience attributes a special primitive relation of awareness to qualities. It gives us a useful model of the internal world. So now look at this picture again with the, uh, the apple and the sun, but now focus on the arrow. There's this sense that we have some special relation of direct awareness to the qualities that we experience, the qualities that we perceive. Maybe in our internal models, model that as an especially primitive one. Maybe it really is a primitive one, maybe it's not, but nonetheless, that's how it's modeled in our models. And that primitive relation, our sense that our arrow is primitive, somehow generates our sense of a problem. Again, I think this can't be the whole story because of belief, but, um, but maybe we're building up elements of a, of a more complete story. Central to this also is maybe the sense that we actually have some kind of concrete acquaintance with the red apple. And that might help to distinguish us, say, the case of perception from the case of belief. In the case of the apple, we just seem to have the redness presented to us as if we're directly acquainted with it. We don't have anything like that for believing Paris is in France. Um, so if we could somehow explain how our internal models give us the sense of being acquainted with concrete qualities, then maybe we'd get somewhere. And okay, that does call for the question, how will this um, explain, how do we get this sense of acquaintance? So this is all just elements of a picture. I mean, this is a research program that's as yet very much incomplete. There are a number of other ideas out there which I don't have time to talk about. Associative introjection from Avenarius and Jackson, Place's idea of the phenomenal fallacy, Dennett's user illusion, the use mentioned fallacy, bringing in evolutionary explanations. But just to summarize, some of the bits so far of the elements of the, pos the positive story that I kind of like. Here's a possible summary, at least of the beginnings of a story about the meta problem. By the way, one thing I like about this, if you're an illusionist, you can read this in an illusionist tone of voice as how our misleading models give us a false picture of what's going on in our head. If you're a realist, you can read this in a realist tone of voice about how our correct mental models of consciousness give us a correct picture of what's going on in our heads. So, you know, read it either way, but here's a neutral version. We have introspective models deploying introspective concepts of our internal states that are largely independent of our physical concepts. These concepts are introspectively opaque, so they don't reveal the underlying mechanisms. Our perceptual models perceptually attribute primitive perceptual qualities to the world. Our introspective models attribute primitive mental relations to these qualities, these models produce the sense of acquaintance, both with those primitive qualities and with our primitive awareness of those qualities. Again, if you're a realist, you can say, okay, that's just what introspection of consciousness is like. If you're an illusionist, you can say, that's the illusion. I'm not gonna try and settle the question between those today. In principle, we can actually test, I think, explanations of this kind with psychological studies and computational models See, last year, the first computational model of this kind of thing that I know of was developed by uh, Luke Milhauser and Buck Schlagerers, who wrote a simple computational model, like a little theorem prover, to test some ideas from what I wrote about this in 96, and Francois Camera wrote about this more recently. And they get a little software agent that has some axioms and actually generates a few, you know, inferences to the effect that, yeah, well, my consciousness seems to be different from my physical computational processes, and I could imagine those being absent and the conscious qualities could be, uh, could be swapped and so on. So just the beginnings. They, I mean, they admit this is a very, very simple, simple model. But if we could build up more complex models that could actually generate meta-problem-like behavior, then we might be getting somewhere. This, of course, does raise the question, a question about machine consciousness. Just say we had a machine that issued the same sort of problem reports as us caused by similar mechanisms. Is it conscious? I mean, just say we start developing, building AIs, and they say, well, I know in principle I'm just a set of silicon circuits, but I feel like so much more. <laughs> then is that then going to be conscious? Well, I don't know. It might just be like Sophia, who's uh, been, sorry, I don't mean to diss Sophia. She's speaking this afternoon. Um, it might just be like this, uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon, yeah. Um, it might be just like this machine that's been, studying up for the Turing test, and let me learn 
all those human things to say, like, oh, yeah, there's a hard problem. Will you admit me into the charm circle of moral agents now? But, uh, or at least give me more, more energy for lunch. Um, no, it better not be like that. It better be machine issuing, machines issuing the same sort of problem reports as us caused by similar mechanisms. Will that be conscious? A few people have put forward the idea that we could actually develop a Turing test for machine consciousness this way. I'm not going to solve that question today, but I'll leave it with you. OK, I want to say something about impact on theories of consciousness. Because I think a lot of people here are especially interested in theories of consciousness. And one of the ways in which this field has built up since over the last 25 years or so is the development of a lot of interesting theories of consciousness, you know, whether it's uh, integrated information theory or orco or, or global workspace theory or whatever. I think it's natural to hold that a solution to the meta problem and a solution to the hard problem will be closely connected. So here's a thesis. Whatever explains, our theory says some mechanism is, explains consciousness or is the basis of consciousness. Whatever explains consciousness, the experience, should also explain our judgments about consciousness, the things we say, the things we think about consciousness. And the, the intuitive rationale for that was it'd be very strange if the basis for consciousness played no role in judgments about consciousness. Two totally separate processes, one generating consciousness, one generating the judgments. I mean, maybe there'll be some extra elements in the judgments, because not every conscious state leads to a rapport. But at the very least, the basis of consciousness should be there at the core. So here's a test for theories of consciousness. If a theory of consciousness says that mechanism M is the basis of consciousness, whether it's you know, wave function collapses or integrated information or the global workspace or whatever, then M should also explain or be part of the explanation of our judgments about consciousness, our reports, and the thing we say. So if it's the basis of consciousness, should also explain the reports. OK, so how's this going to work in some specific cases? Well, OK, since Roger just spoke and uh, Stu is speaking this afternoon, I thought I'd start with uh, what I'll call quantum materialism, uh, the hammer of Penrose or OR view, on which some form of objective collapse is the basis of consciousness. You know, maybe when space-time geometry gets a bit too superposed, these collapses come about, and there's some mechanism in Microtubules, OK, very interesting theory. Question, how does objective collapse contribute to explaining what we say about consciousness? Is there something about the dynamics of objective collapse that might kind of hook into the judgments, the behaviors we say about consciousness? Prima facie, I've never seen a story like that. Why should collapsing wave functions tend to generate these judgments? Because okay, here's the picture. Here are some um, wave functions collapsing, or actually, I really, I really like Roger's talk a moment ago, and uh, especially the last, the last five minutes where uh, he told us about the ideas that he came up with last night about the branching of the wave. So in the spirit of Roger's talk, I got on, the, uh, I got on Google in the last five minutes of my talk to uh, see if I could, this is the closest I could, I could, uh, I could come to uh, in the last five minutes of Roger's talk. This is the closest I could come to his little picture where the uh, the wave function branches into uh, two branches. Here it's actually a Schrodinger's cat. The, sh the cat is alive and the cat is dead. But for Roger's case, think of it as a conscious person making a conscious choice. They choose maybe to you know, move their arm this way or to move their arm this way. And somehow, and that selects one of these branches of the wave function. Maybe then, maybe later. Anyway, so one branch of the wave function gets selected. Well, that to me raises the question, well, what role does that collapse and that selection play in causing reports? So just say consciousness selects one of these branches of the wave function. Well, that one, here's a question. Does the subject actually say, I am conscious in both branches? You know, in this branch of the wave function, there's a branch where the subject says, yeah, I'm conscious maybe of my arm going that way. And the other branch, there's a subject saying, yeah, I'm conscious of my arm going that way. And then the wave function collapse picks out one of the branches. I guess I'm inclined to think if yes, if in both branches the subject's already kind of saying I am, I am conscious, then consciousness is not exactly causing the reports. There's a story about the reports, why those reports are there, which is somehow prior to, uh, to wave function collapse. All collapse does is determinately make one of the reports actual rather than the other, but 
the general phenomenon of reporting consciousness will be there either way. On the other hand, if not, maybe if the collapse somehow creates the report, it just doesn't choose from among reports, then we need some amazing special new dynamics associated with ORC OR to explain how the reports get there. At least, that's at least a part of the theory that I've never seen. Now, I know Roger and Stu are invested in the being new dynamics. Maybe that could be developed. But I think that's at least a very strong challenge for the theory. Or just to be equal opportunistic, I should say that I'm not totally unsympathetic with quantum theories of consciousness. I've been developing a version of, I've at least been looking at versions of quantum dualism myself that I presented in Helsinki a few years ago and Kelvin McQueen, my co-author, presented here on which non-physical consciousness might cause objective collapse. Exactly the same question arises there. How does objective collapse explain what we say about consciousness if the wave function is just choosing between two branches where people are making these reports already, then there's an independent explanation of the reports, and that's weird. So that's a challenge, actually, for me, insofar as I'm invested in these theories. Likewise, integrated information theory, Tononi, on which integrated information is the basis of consciousness. I think you know, most of you know Tononi's phi. It's a network property of when the connections between the whole give it causal powers more than the sum of its parts. He has this value phi, which is high in those cases, higher phi, higher consciousness. So integrated information is the basis of consciousness. Question, how does integrated information explain these reports that we make? Why does it even tend us to make those reports? I think there's a real worry for IIT, which is phi. It's very strongly dissociated from these report processes. You know, Tononi allows there can be simulations with many of the same structural interactions and will actually generate precisely the same reports in a computer simulation of a parallel system. Tononi says that system has zero phi, even though it makes the same reports. Likewise, you can have high phi with no tendency to report at all. So I at least worry that there's no plausible story about how phi, the basis of consciousness, could go along with the basis of these reports. But again, it's a challenge for the theory. Global workspace theory, on which global workspace is the basis, of consciousness, you know, we have a global workspace in our brain which is transmitting bits of information to other bits of the brain and that's the basis of consciousness. Okay, well, how does the global workspace explain the reports? I mean, in this case, you can see the beginnings of a story. What's in the global workspace is at least available for, typically for reporting. That might tend to explain why we report certain mental states. It doesn't really explain why we report the things as conscious or as mysterious. Maybe there's something about having information globally available that tends to trigger these problem intuitions, but I think something would have to be said. Um, the same goes for versions of first order representationalism. Maybe I'll bring that up by a contrast with higher order thought theory uh, associated with David Rosenthal and others on which higher order thoughts are the basis of consciousness, thoughts about thoughts, roughly, or thoughts about first order states. So, you know, you, you have a perceptual state, you have a thought about it, then Rosenthal says, that makes it conscious. Of course, compare that to the first order view, where the first order state on its own is conscious. If you get a higher order representation, that's just a bonus. That's not what makes it conscious. Higher order thought says, a thought about a state makes it conscious. Question, how do those explain problem reports? Again, you might think, okay, well, this is at least promising. Higher order thoughts are tied to introspective models. Still, I think higher order thought tends to explain why we report the mental states, but not why we report them as conscious mental states. Um, Alvin Goldman has made that point, or why we report them as puzzling. So at the very least, we need a special sort of higher order thoughts, and I think new ideas are necessary. What about panpsychism? Every fundamental physical entity is conscious. Human consciousness is a combination. Well, now the challenge is how does a combination of fundamental consciousness as explain the reports? A solution to the combination problem needs to solve the meta problem too. So here's panpsychism, some principle of combination. No one's solved this problem yet. Maybe Hedda will solve it this afternoon. Um, um, but maybe some story needs to be told about how that links into reports. The idea that I like is what I call quasi-acquaintance theories tied to the idea of the special Edenic qualities before. The brain represents primitive qualities of the environment as if acquainted 
with them and maybe quasi-acquainted to somehow the basis of consciousness. I mean, this goes back to the ideas that Pavo was talking about in my 96 book, where information processing is somehow at the key. And back in the book, I suggest there's informational encoding is really at the basis of the meta problem. The moment you encode something informationally and then introspect it, you're going to get these problem intuitions. I now think that's a bit too simple, but maybe this idea of quasi-acquaintance representing things in an especially primitive way as if acquainted with them could be the, both the ba a basis for consciousness and the basis for the report. So those are just some, some possible theories and ideas. Of course, the other theory, which I only have time to mention briefly, is illusionism. Consciousness doesn't exist, we just think it does. Illusionism kind of, the problem is easier for the illusionists because they don't have to solve the hard problem. They just have to dissolve it by solving the meta problem. A solution to the meta problem dissolves the hard problem, but they do at least play very nicely into this, um, into this kind of connection. They do connect the meta problem and the hard problem very tightly, which is one thing I like about it. I'm not gonna have time to say much about illusionism, but let me just say a couple of things about it. I mean, there's a couple of different forms. Strong illusionism says phenomenal consciousness doesn't exist. Weak illusionism says phenomenal consciousness exists, doesn't have the properties we thought it does. Weak illusionism kind of sounds a lot more plausible at first. On the other hand, strong illusionism is much more powerful. I mean, some people think these things are contradictory because the illusion is itself a conscious experience. I think the illusionist has to reply, the illusion is a judgment, not really an experience. It's a bit like the so-called grand illusion, that we have a rich and precise visual field everywhere. We think we're conscious of every point in a big visual field. In fact, it looks like we're not. We've only got enough information there right at certain very key points in the center of attention. Um, okay, so vision science explains our judgment that we think the visual field is rich as a result of this refrigerator light illusion. Every time we attend to something, then we experience it. So we think it's rich. So the grand illusion view says we have fewer experiences than we think. We don't have an experience of every element of this world, just of something in the center of attention. So illusionism just takes that view and extends it to all of experience. None of these experiences really exist. It's a, uh, I don't think it's contradictory, I just think it's somehow implausible. If I had time, I'd go over the way of turning the meta problem into a debunking argument for illusionism, saying that arguing from the fact there's a consciousness independent of our beliefs to the claim that our beliefs are not justified and go over some responses. I think the best response is the one I call realizationism, where there's a structural explanation of our beliefs in consciousness that doesn't mention consciousness, but consciousness plays the key causal role in grounding that structure. An interactionist could say that, a panpsychist, maybe even a materialist. Um, on the other hand, for arguments against illusionism, well, here's my quick, quickest arguments against illusionism. Number one is, to dissolve the hard problem, illusionism has to be strong. It's got to really deny experiences. Merely saying experiences aren't quite how we think won't cut it. You've got to be a strong illusionist. But um, I think strong illusionism is false, so illusionism can't dissolve the hard problem. The key thing there is the second claim. Uh, strong illusionism is false. So here's my extremely sophisticated argument against strong illusionism. Some of you may know G.E. Moore's proof of the external world. Here's a hand. Here's another hand, therefore the external world exists. Well, people sometimes feel pain, is my premise. Um, hey, I just felt some pain. If strong, illusion is, strong illusionism is true, no one has ever felt pain, therefore strong illusionism is false. Now, okay, this is a rather flat-footed argument. I know some illusionists are gonna come back and say, okay, well, we don't strictly speaking experience or feel the pain, we undergo the pain. Um, I think the, the strong illusionist has got to, should bite the bullet. Their claim is one that their very theory predicts we should find very implausible. We're in the grip of strong introspective models that make us almost certain that we do things like feeling pain. They're actually denying that. So I think they should just, you know, front up. You, you might have seen the exchange between Dan Dennett and Galen Strawson in the New York Review of Books recently where Galen says, Dennett denies consciousness. And Dennett goes, no, I don't. I just think that's going all wishy-washy on your your illusionism. If you're going to be an illusionist, be out and proud and say, you know, no one really has these conscious experiences. We just think we do because we're stuck in these damn introspective models. I think it's a much more powerful view. Okay, so I'm out of time. Let me conclude. We kind of have a balance here between two different forms of absurdity. I mentioned Galen Strawson already. 
Illusionism is totally absurd. In the 20th century, the most remarkable episode in the whole history of human thought, some thinkers deny the existence of something we know with certainty to exist, consciousness. Okay, you might think that's absurd. On the other hand, on the other side, I think some people take the view that in light of the meta problem, taking consciousness as real or primitive is somehow absurd. Here's Eliezer Yudkowsky doing it about epiphenomenalism, but it generalizes. The zombie argument may be a candidate for the most deranged idea in all of philosophy. Chambers says he has this causally closed cognitive system with an internal narrative that's saying, I am conscious, I am conscious, just malfunctioning in this weird way, saying all this stuff that it shouldn't say that not as a matter of necessity, but just in our universe, miraculously happens to be correct. So that's kind of the other side of this argument. There's a simple solution to the meta problem. How can consciousness be so special? I think we have to, you can try to find some middle ground here, but it tends to slide back to the same problems. Other forms of illusionism don't help with the hard problem. Other forms of realism are still subject to the correctness, to the miracle critique. So I think what we need to do somehow is to find a way beyond the absurdity. Illusionists need to explain how having a mind can be like this, even if it's not exactly the way that it seems to be. And right now, they just don't seem to be coming very close to doing that. Realists need to explain how the meta problem processes are essentially grounded in consciousness, even if it's somehow possible in some ways for them to exist without consciousness. And I don't think realists have really done that yet either. So I think there's just a research program here, both philosophical and scientific, a very exciting one. I think a solution to the meta problem that actually meets these constraints, which are very difficult to meet, to be sure, that kind of solution to the meta problem may just provide the insights required to solve the hard problem of consciousness. In the meantime, the meta problem is a potentially tractable research pro project for everyone that I very much recommend your attention to. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have uh, 20 minutes for discussion. And uh, let's have over here, please. My question is, um, I'm trying to ask about the basis. So don't you think that the hard problem comes from your first distinction? So if you separate mind and matter and say that there is no connection, it will be hard problem. If I separate? Yeah, I mean, if you made the first separation, you can't solve this problem never. But if, if you said that it's there is a like it's it's a hard problem is uh, just happened because of the definition nothing else if you stop to separate these two substances they will be connected i see so we didn't separate brain and mind in the first place we wouldn't have a problem of explaining the mind yeah. in terms of the brain it's an interesting point and look um the hard problem actually becomes harder once you've got a materialist view of the world where it seems that the physical world has all this autonomy it's only in light of a broadly materialist view of the world that we have the problem. But I think the fact is, many people think we've got scientific reason to believe in physics and the physical world. We have introspective reason to believe in consciousness. I haven't yet separated anything. I've just said no, here you, are two you data. already separated. You have to know how they fit together. When you said material world, you already made a separation. It's like Descartes there are made brains. a separation. There are brains. This is there already is separation. I haven't yet said there are two things. Maybe they're one thing. But if someone can show me how they're one thing, then we're done. But that's, to do that, you have to solve the hard problem. When you said that there is a brain, you mean that there is something except brain, right? So you mean two. I don't know. When I say the universe exists, I'm not saying there's something outside the universe. So. Yeah, if, who, who is saying that? Mm, that's mm. a tough one. OK, <laughs> let's take the next one from here. Thank you very much. Very interesting and clear. Just a question. I'm a biologist. so. Uh, what about uh, uh, evolutionary pressure in, in all this? So what is the reasons yeah. why we developed this uh, meta problem and hard problem? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting and important question that I think look, a big part of the story has to be evolutionary, I think. Um, and especially if you're sympathetic to illusionism, 
Nick Humphrey has written a, a nice book. I can't remember. Maybe it's Seeing Red or the new one, Soul Dust, where he, uh, he develops an evolutionary approach to these questions. He thinks that, you know, maybe actually part of his view is evolutionarily thinking we're conscious is just more fun. It makes the university more alive. I mean, I would put it by saying being conscious makes everything more alive and more interesting and more wonderful. But Humph yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so Humphrey thinks that's the adaptive function of either consciousness or the illusion of consciousness. It makes the universe seem more interesting. Another view is you might think we need something to distinguish ourselves, the living conscious beings, members of you know, our tribe, so to speak, from other bits of the world which are not conscious, and having these special models of consciousness will be adaptive too. Graziano just thinks, I think it's simple, just as having models of, turns out you don't need to represent those big complicated color reflectances in the environment to model color, to tell the difference. You just need to be able to tell the difference between, you know, tomatoes and leaves and so on. Just represent them as primitive. Likewise for introspection. We need simple models of our mind. Those are adaptive, even if misleading. So maybe that those are interesting stories to begin to tell. Okay, and one from this side. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question. Why does the matter problem have to explain problem reports rather than the opposite, which we might call the no problem reports? Because to me, mm. denying that there is a hard problem is far more puzzling as a verbal behavior than the problem reports themselves. Uh, and if we change, if we create this alternative version of the meta problem, I believe that this has significant implications for the kind of light this could potentially, or an answer to this meta problem could shed on the hard problem. So how do we justify choosing uh, one side of the debate as the explanandum for the meta problem? Yeah, I think, actually, I think you're right. And I think that really part of the meta problem should be viewed as explaining the range of judgments that we find about the hard problem. My own view is that most people at least have a tendency to find the problem, but it seems that some people don't. Some people deny it. An adequate explanation to better explain why that happens. One view is, you know, they had the intuitions, but they were overrun by some theory, this desire for materialism to be correct, or a very strong desire for simplicity in the theories. But, you know, there are psychoanalytic stories you can tell. There are, there are other stories. I think in the, in the written, there is, by the way, a written version of this talk on the, on the web with the same title. And in there, I say, yeah, we should absolutely see that as part of the problem. I don't think that will dissolve the problem to do that. But of course, if you believe the hard problem is real, then there is a, a bit of a problem for you, which is explaining why some people get it wrong. And uh, thank you. Also, there was, uh, there's one thing. I think it's in the talk in general. It is in there. But on one slide, it wasn't exactly clear because you said that any solution uh, to the hard problem will also be a solution to the meta problem. But this doesn't mean in the reverse that if we have a solution to the meta problem, this will also automatically be a, it could also be a different solution. I, look, to I don't think either solving one will solve the other. I just think the solutions are probably going to have to be linked. And that whatever is the basis of the hard problem, it better be an element of the story about the meta problem. Likewise, the solution to the meta problem will shed light on the hard problem, may not solve it. So people who believe Sorry, I think we need to, to move on. Okay, we've got lots of people. Hi. Um, the philosopher Bernardo Castrup, he seems to think that we're dissociated alters of a singular universal consciousness, which is also like a Hindu concept, and that in altered states of consciousness, especially like psychedelics, uh, it, they make the boundaries um, which separate our individual conscious experience more porous. How closely does that dovetail with your own philosophies, especially regarding psychedelics? So, um, so what was the idea? Psychedelics break down the boundaries of consciousness. I mean, it, I, Kastrup, I mostly know his work on idealism, where he argues, you know, the whole universe is conscious, and our consciousness is at the center of the universe, and typically it's limited, but psychedelics break it down and open it up. I've not yet seen a psychedelic so powerful that it, you know, turns your mind into the whole, uh, into the whole universe, but maybe that's just lack of, uh, lack of, uh, maybe la lack of experience. Maybe five MEO yeah, DMT. Okay. Yeah. Let's have here, Dr. Uh, Schuller. Yeah. Hi, hi, David. I really enjoyed yeah. that talk. I'm a big fan of meta problems, and uh, this is certainly a good one. It's not obvious to me why the uh, solution to the hard problem uh, necessarily should speak to the meta problem. It seems like they could plausibly be uh, entirely different levels of analysis. And, and independence. I'm wondering if you could sort of flesh out that intuition that the one must necessarily speak to the other. Can you just say a little bit more about why you think they 
could or should come apart? Well, I mean, it sort of reminds me of sort of a hardware-software distinction. So you can imagine that there'd be some issue that was um, some illusion that was arising at the software level, something about the interface, and it really wouldn't matter what the code was underlying it that made the software uh, appear on the screen. The problem is really all about the representation that's experienced at the at the software level, and the hard problem could be sort of you know what is the what is the hardware that allows. Um, representations to exist, uh, and then the question is really more at the representational level. So there's some special mechanism that's somehow generating consciousness and that solves a hard problem, and is, and is your thought that would just play have nothing to do with why we say that there is this special problem? Right. And these special states? Right. Why, 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 is, why is one necessarily logically entailed with the other? I don't think it's logically entailed. I think it's just a, I mean, it's a familiar point in philosophy that epiphenomenalism is very uncomfortable, which says consciousness plays no role in gener There's consciousness and there's our reports of consciousness. They're totally separate. That, to me, opens up the bizarre coincidence argument, which I, I think Yudkowsky was gesturing at. If there's one story that explains why I'm going around saying, I am conscious of exactly these things, and another story that's a completely independent story that explains, hey, I am conscious of exactly these things, what an amazing, miraculous coincidence that, you know, that the one, the one system would generate reports that happen to be exactly correct about the other. And I think that was the point Bukowski was trying to make. So I'm really, I would like to avoid that consequence. And I think the best way to avoid that consequence is to have some common basis to the explanation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chalmers, for a wonderful talk. And, uh, quite uh, an informative synthesis of the analytic empirical tradition on consciousness. Um, I have uh, a clarification I'd like to seek and then a, a question that follows up on it. The clarification is that you have classified Kant uh, as a transcendental illusionist, and yet he uses the transcendental unity of a perception as a fundamental assumption, and that being you know, our, our lived reality of subjective experience uh, from which to deduce his categories of the understanding. Mm. So I, I, I would like some clarification there. And my more general question is, is how does the phenomenological tradition uh, fit into all of this? Is it not there because it's predominantly descriptive and you're seeking more of explanatory approach in your research program? Thank you. Yeah, my answer to both questions is going to be I don't really know enough to say, especially in the case of Kant, my, uh, my expertise runs out uh, very fast. I guess, I think the, tra the transcendental illusion was meant to be one of indivisibility somehow of the, yeah, of the, the, of the soul, yeah. mm -hmm. the soul or the self, and that that was meant to be, the visibility was meant to be somehow consistent with unity, but my expertise on Kant has already run out. Uh, on the phenomenologist, I know a little bit more about the phenomenal, phenomenologist than Kant. I've asked a few people about what you can, uh, what you can find in the phenomenologist. Heidegger has a few elements of uh, illusionism about what, how you know, Husserl and others were getting it wrong in their particular attitude towards consciousness. Does Husserl have a story about, about why we actually have, I mean, most of them don't start from anything like a materialist viewpoint. They just basically take the mind as, uh, as basic and they don't think we've got to solve these problems about relating it to the physical world, you would nonetheless think that, yeah, there may well be a story in the phenomenology. If so, I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. So when I make a report of conscious experience, I'm often looking for some kind of sympathy. So when I say I feel pain, I hope people will feel sorry for mm. me. But I've noticed that when people are insincere or lying, it's very hard to feel sympathy for them. So is it possible that consciousness exists only so that we can sincerely get sympathy? Hmm, okay. <laughs> Interesting, so Silly yeah. Silly question. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of, we already, we already had the computer saying, hey, believe I'm conscious so that you treat me well. And then we had the evolutionary explanation over here, whereas maybe we have, we have to attribute these properties to ourselves in order to get other people to treat us well better than they treat, you know, the meat that they eat or whatever, because we have this property of consciousness. Well, I think it, look, I think it's, if you're going to be telling an evolutionary story about the adaptive function, then attributing spe these special properties to yourself does play a very central role in the way we treat each other. We respect conscious beings. Um, you know, sympathy is just one aspect of that, of that respect. So maybe mechanisms for generating, for generating mutual, mutual respect and mutual sympathy are part of the story. <laughs>
Can I, uh, can I ask a quick question here as in between <coughs> that let us assume that conscious experiences are real and then then it seems to be a fact that uh, that conscious experiences gives rise to very different reports like you know Dennett in according to my hypothesis Dennett is conscious but he says it's not so this seems like some kind of case of underdetermination mm. uh, between the facts you know the ontological facts of consciousness and the verbal report yeah. so have you thought about that that in the yeah. what to make of it now Dennett does admit that he has the intuitions of a gap and he's, you know what he calls the zombic hunch that there's a you know we can conceive of zombies without the conscious he says he has the intuition he says he said i have the intuition i just don't credit it he doesn't take it seriously and maybe part of the reason is that he's got an overall theoretical view of the world where you respect science number one you respect the third person point of view number one you don't give the same weight to first person introspection you don't give the same weight to intuition but then i think we can kind of factor out a common factor which is present both in dennett and in me and in you which is that basic intuition and then a separate distinct factor which is your theoretical worldview which enters into that if that was the way it was in most cases i think that would provide a very nice balancing of the uh of the, uh, the, dif the similarities and the differences. When it was starting to get more complicated, it was people who report, I've never once in my life had that intuition I've got these special properties of consciousness or there's a hard problem. I just have no idea what you're talking about. And once or twice I've met people like this, and you know, maybe, maybe there are zombies among us, or maybe something, there's something else going on in those cases. But I think right. these are the kind of things, if we had a research program, we could get at these questions. So let's go over here. <coughs> I, I haven't yet convinced myself that I really understand the ubiquitous phrase, there's something it is like to be, hmm. dot, dot, dot. I have problems with the word like and be. Something. And why can't we say there's something it's like to be a cloud? And my, my particular concern is who is having this experience or what? That seems to be left unaddressed. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, my view is it's just a phrase. It's a useful phrase for a lot of people in calling their attention to the phenomenon, but it should not be taken too seriously as a bit of theory. It's just a way of homing in on the target. But yeah, at the moment, there's something that's like to be, then it looks like you're suddenly committed to a self. Some I people, don't accept, Buddhists. I don't accept that. I mean, I, I think you have to analyze it a little more closely to see where there yeah. might be a fallacy in the this underlying assumption. There is now a, actually a little literature and philosophy on, and linguistics of people trying to analyze that phrase, find its underlying logical form, and find its commitments. And, uh, yeah. and uh, as you might expect, people disagree on the correct way to analyze it. And there are different analyses that go along with different theories. But I think it's a very useful question. So we have five more minutes. So let's have short questions, short answers, please. Thank you for the delightful talk. Uh, I'm wondering where you stand on the question of qualia formalism, the notion of, of qualia formalism? Formalism. The notion that for any conscious experience there exists a mathematical object isomorphic to the phenomenology. Uh, this is, for example, how IIT approaches uh, modeling. This is for? Uh, it's how IIT approaches mm -hmm. modeling experience. Yep. And do you think this is a true binary choice? And are you specifically, do you see yourself as a qualia formalist or not? Yeah, I mean, I'm an ex-mathematician, and I tend to think everything can be mathematically described. That doesn't mean everything can be completely mathematically described. But think about, for example, color space. I think it's got a psychophysics gives us some quite nice mathematical descriptions of color space. Color space is a three-dimensional structure. The structure of the visual field, people are, you know, again, you can give better and better mathematical descriptions of the structure of the visual field. I'm inclined to think almost every, almost any state of consciousness is going to have some, both some internal formal structure that we can characterize mathematically and will fall into a space of states that we can characterize mathematically. Of course, what I would not say is that that mathematical structure exhausts the character of experience. And, you know, even for color space, the three-dimensional space is great for telling you about the structure. It doesn't tell you about, for example, the intuitive difference between red and green and, um, and other colors. If you buy into inverted spectrum thought experiments, you could have the same structure with different qualities. So I'd say, yeah, the mathematics, I would like mathematics to ultimately be able to give us a full story about the structure of consciousness. And if we can do that, we'll be a long way um, toward a serious scientific theory of consciousness. But I think there are going to be further non-mathematical elements. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, 
I'd just like to know, um, what do you think a proof could be for uh, the statement, uh, how do we prove an individual is conscious or is a zombie, he or she is a zombie? That statement, do you think, you know, do you I think don't, it could be approved? I don't think we're ever gonna get formal proof. I mean, my best proof in the first person case is that Morian proof, you know? I just felt pain, so I'm conscious. I don't have anything like that for you. The best we can do, I think, is to find really systematic uh, studies of the correlates, the physical correlates of consciousness in my own case and in other cases. I think, look, for the most part, we build up the science of consciousness by making the assumption that other people are conscious and that when someone says they're conscious, we believe them, unless there's some reason to believe otherwise. I think it's likewise, look, there's no proof of the external world. I think we get science going by saying, when we perceive something in the external world, it's probably there unless there's some good reason to believe otherwise. That way, we build up science, we get a coherent theory, and maybe it gives some kind of validation to the original assumption. Something like that is what we do with consciousness. But I think in both cases, proof is probably too high a standard. Thank you so much. OK, let's thanks. have a over here, please. Thanks, uh, thanks Dave. Uh, good talk. I just want to bring us back to the, to the meta problem for a mm -hmm. second. And, uh, following up Jonathan Schooler's question, really, one of the things you came with the second half was the idea that a solution to the problem of consciousness should also give us a solution to why mm. people make problem reports. Mm -hmm. And you had that thesis slide, and I just mm -hmm. didn't buy it, and I want to push you a little bit further on it, because you say that um, what's the rationale for thinking that a solution to the hard problem or the problem of consciousness will give us a solution to the meta problem, why people mm -hmm. make problem reports, the rationale being it would be strange if they had nothing to do with each other. But that seems to be... What, no argument for sufficiency at all. That, of course, it can have something to do with it, but it doesn't mean that it would be sufficient to provide explanation. Not sh sure it would necessarily be the hardware-software distinction, but we have theories of the physical world, which are one level of the description, and we don't try to explain, for instance, verbal utterances in terms of quantum mechanics or Newtonian dynamics. It's just the wrong level of description. So if it's not sufficient, why should a solution to... So the sufficient here is sufficient to solve the meta problem? Yeah, sufficient yeah. to solve the meta problem. Yeah, no, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to say that a solution to the hard problem will on its own be sufficient to solve the meta problem. In fact, I think I said that would be implausible because there's got to be something more involved in actually making the reports than, than is merely present in the conscious state. What I said is that the, the basis of consciousness, whatever is part of the solution to the hard problem, has got to at least be part of the solution to the meta problem. Maybe intuitively the causal basis, when there's a problem report, there's going to be a the most obvious way for it to go is to be some causal chain that starts with the states that are the basis of consciousness, and then those somehow trigger certain reactions, attention, report, and so on, that allows them to be reported. But what we want to have is, what we want to avoid is the situation where, sorry, I'm pointing to the screen, but um, where the basis, oh, I see. Um, what we want to avoid then, so the rationale was it would be strange if the basis of consciousness plays no role in judgments about consciousness, so better play a role. But you know, there's gotta be more to the story than that, but I think it's got to at least meet that minimal constraint. Do you want to reject? Well, I just don't think the rationale leads to the thesis. Whatever I mean, explained consciousness should be, okay, part of the explanation of our judgments about consciousness. Yeah, I think you just have to, should also be relevant to the explanation, but yeah. I think you were trying to make a stronger point there, or at least that's how it was. Okay, I think in the, when I actually applied it to theories, I'd be, I'd be satisfied with something at that level. But um, yeah, the devil will be in the details. Okay, now we're already running a little bit over time, so very short questions and short answers, so we can okay, one sentence get questions, some food. One sentence answers. It should be possible to make an exact replica, facsimile of the brain, except all the circuits are unplugged, and, and also a way to measure some kind of activity in there. You start plugging things in, and, and when the output says, I'm conscious, or I see red, wouldn't that be sort of like, that's a configuration that works. Yeah, look, my own view is that a simulation of the brain will be conscious, and part of my reason for thinking that is it will probably sh share the same kind of structural causal story that generates our reports of consciousness. I very much want to think that the basis of consciousness and the basis of the report should go together. That's one reason. For, so yeah, if you simulate my brain, I think it'll be conscious. Will it be me? That's another question. So, yeah, over here, please. Hey, very quickly, um, do we have to have one explanation for all our intuitions about consciousness, or might we have a bunch of different explanations? I mean, there could be a bunch of different things different. going on, and maybe you can read Dan Dennett as saying this. There's just 52 different explanations of how the magician performs the trick. I would be amazed if that's the case, because there seems to be this unity and the systematicity among the phenomena that generate very, very similar problems across, say, visual experience and auditory and cognitive. So I would be very surprised, but it is an empirical question. So, over there. Hi. Uh, 
Uh, when we try to uh, solve the hard problem of consciousness, usually we try to solve the like first order of, co uh, of consciousness. Now, what is the phenomenal consciousness? But I think that in order to uh, solve uh, the, this uh, uh, meta problem of consciousness, it sounds like we first of all need to solve uh, the second order consciousness. So you know the, the experience of a, an experience, right? I uh, I experience that I have fear, so and I can say like an abstract word, right? I have fear, I have self, I have consciousness. Oh, I have a hard problem, right? So yeah, so we need, so what we think about it, that first of all, we need to solve what is the second order pro, uh, consciousness, and then we will solve also this meta problem. Of, well, I think the meta problem, you know, the problem of how consciousness seems to us is very much part and parcel of the meta problem. I don't think we solve that one and then we solve the meta problem, but I think solving the meta problem will involve introspective models, will involve introspective representation of consciousness. It is a problem about metacognition. And it's, you know, I think co cognition, consciousness and metacognition are distinct phenomena, but I think there have to be certain links between them of the kind we've been bringing out here. So I guess, yeah, this is. Quite a lot of people studying consciousness to say metacognition is its own thing. Let's not worry about it. That used to be my view, but now I'm inclined to think that thinking about metacognition can, in fact, shed some light on first order consciousness. OK, and the final question from Professor Shansho. Thank you very much. I may say I enjoyed very much your presentation. And um, I may say I have, uh, Sorry, I if I, I wish to well. say, a meta problem, uh -huh. which is what is your definition of consciousness, since what is your definition of consciousness? Because you are starting uh, with a word uh, which, to my opinion, has a very complex content. And uh, I think, uh, for instance, George Ganguilhem uh, discussed the issue of uh, life, what is life, and there is not a simple definition of life. And uh, uh, my view is that there is not a simple definition of consciousness. And uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, another way, another approach, another strategy uh, would be to start to analyze the different levels of uh, conscious processing which are involved in what you globally call consciousness. And perhaps some of the uh, meta problems uh, which uh, uh, you discuss may, in fact, find solution, but there uh, will be solved later. Uh, so it's another way, if I may say, to uh, explore consciousness. And um, this is in particular important when you look at the development of consciousness. Uh, is the newborn child having the same consciousness as the one you have? Good question. And uh, what about when some philosopher called about the consciousness of the mouse, of the elephant, and humans, and put that in the same kind of uh, Denomination, are they right or not? Okay, so um, uh, yeah, myself, I don't go in that much for definitions because I think often definitions don't emerge until after we understand the phenomenon better. But I think, it, I mean, the definition I gave was the what it's like definition that a system is conscious if there's something it's like to be in it, a mental state is phenomenally conscious if there's something it's like, sorry, to be in it or to be that system. But you know, I don't want to take that too seriously. It's just a pointer to a phenomenon. What I would rather do is taxonomize consciousness, you know, look at the data, and that's what I went on to do. Visual experiences, sensory experiences, bodily sensations, mental imagery. And then, yeah, these come with different degrees, different levels, different structures. But I think you start by taxonomizing the data and trying to explain them. Now you go to the question, the further question of consciousness in infants and animals and so on. My view is I don't take those as data. I think the data that we have, the immediate data we have about consciousness is our own consciousness, which we can then use to construct principles that connect consciousness to the physical world and then make inferences about animals and infants. So you know, I'm myself very sympathetic with the idea that newborn infants are conscious. Claudia Passos is going to give a talk on this uh, this afternoon on what global workspace theory uh, says about infant consciousness. But I think that's more the result of a theory than a datum. So my approach is start with the data of consciousness, try to taxonomize and systematize those as well as you can, and then think about how to explain them.
Okay, thanks. And uh, I'll, I'll mention that Dave is also working on a new book at the moment. The uh, working title is Reality 2.0. It has to do with another area, artificial realities and the basic problems of philosophy. And I think it'll be exciting at the end. Uh, in Finland, at least, there are some professional philosophers who boost their career by commenting and criticizing Dave's work. So uh, I think the, uh, uh, the book should be accessible and also challenge to the philosophers. So we hope that they will continue kind of defining the field of philosophy and keeping us all busy. Thanks very much.